Dwarves are hardy foes who can withstand a great deal of punishment. Unfortunately for them, their speed is greatly hampered by their small stature. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Let's Play Shining Force 3. My name is Total Biscuit and this is Battle 8 at the Switching Point. Welcome to Shining Force 3's first gimmick battle. That is a train! Sort of. Not particularly a good train, but yeah, the Saturn's 3D rendering capabilities are not best demonstrated by some of the models in the sort of 2.5D two, two isometric battle view that we've got going on here, but never mind. Now, these are the five refugees you saw in the thread in the little plot element, and they are running away from the, Dis the Dystonian border guards, who are right over there. Each of these refugees has a different movement speed. They cannot defend themselves at all. Now... Unlike most modern video games, this game does not have any qualms whatsoever in the killing of children. Indeed, if the guards catch these guys, they will kill them all. They will slaughter the entire family, even the little girl at the back included. Isn't she cute? Well, if we don't do something about it, she's going to be a little more than a bloodstain on the floor. Very unpleasant. So if you want some motivation, well, there it is. Now, pulling this off is incredibly tricky. I cannot count the amount of time in previous playthroughs I've actually screwed this up. It's unbelievably hard to do properly, and indeed, even if you do execute it properly, sometimes things go wrong, just because the game is not entirely predictable. Now, you'll see these soldiers around here, they're going to be moving forward. They move faster than all of the refugees, and to make it worse, the refugees move at different speeds. So you have to make sure that they all get moved to exactly the right place at the right time. So what they're going to need to do is cross the railway, and if they can get across the railway line then the train can come alongside them and actually block off the entrance to the guards so that they can't come over and pursue them. It's tricky. And even then, once they're in the middle, they're not safe. Because, of course, once the train's moved out of the way, well, the guards can come over anyway. There's a bunch of guards in the middle, and, of course, there's a whole load of enemy units over there as well. So we're going to move these forward, and I'm going to be cutting out a lot of the irrelevant stuff. So just be prepared for that. We're focusing mainly on the re rescue of the refugees, and then we'll finish off everybody towards the end. Again, got to be very careful with the positioning here, because if you don't, you see that? You should be able to see there the break in the fence. We need to get everyone up to there so that they can cross, and I believe they need to cross by the end of turn three, or the start of turn four. The only way they're going to be able to do that is if we move Dantes over to that little red lever over there. He's got to cross and pull that red lever by the start of turn three. Because if he doesn't, then the train coming the other way is going to be moving at high speed and it's going to block off our escape. If we switch the switching point, the train coming from the west to the east is forced to slow down because it has to go around that brown-coloured siding there, which gives us enough time to get the refugees over the railway track. Tricky to say the least. Execution is key here. Dantes is the only one that can do it in time. And the worst thing about having Dantes do this is that there's actually an enemy in the way that you can see there. However, we are exploiting the AI here. Remember how I said the AI would generally go for a vulnerable target if it had the opportunity? Well, in this case, it has the opportunity. And instead of going for Dantes and blocking the way, which would have actually caused Dantes to be unable to cross the track in time, he went for Slate instead. So yes, we're using him as a little bit of a sacrificial lamb there, and it works relatively well. In the meantime, the rest of our force is going to flank around the side and deal with these one at a time. There's a couple of nice hidden items in this level as well, so we're going to be keeping an eye out for those. And indeed, I believe there's actually one here, if I remember correctly. Yes, there's a healing drop hidden in the tree. Don't ask me why. Now, Obright actually comes into his own in this battle somewhat, mainly because there's so many Dystonian soldiers that he can actually do a re reasonable amount of damage to. He's going to be chasing up Julian, and he's going to be chasing up Dantes. Every time you hear that train noise, the trains actually move a little bit. They take so long to do it that I've cut them out of the video, but you can clearly see where the train is now. And uh, we have to get across with Dantes to flip that switch next turn which shouldn't be a problem. Now, what I'm more worried about is making sure that we get everyone positioned correctly here so that they can cross. They're not going to be able to cross next turn. We can't get everyone across that way. It's not good enough. Now, you'll notice that Benetrum actually mentioned at the start that we don't want to stop on the tracks. That's a game mechanic restriction. You cannot stop on the tracks at all. It won't let you stay there. So you have to be able to cross it clear in one turn. 
which is tricky because, again, all of the different refugees have different movement speeds. So we've got to position them all to get them all across in one turn. Otherwise, we will fail the synchronicity system. You can see here, he can't get across. So we're just going to keep him there for the moment, equip our blade, and eliminate this Dystonian soldier. Now, the Estonian soldiers are going to continue to chase. They will move up to their maximum movement speed. They are very close. They will continue to be very close, and you have no margin for error here at all. The smaller civilians, you know, the kids and the weaker ones, will die in one hit. The There's a tougher one, uh, who I assume is the father of the family, who can take one hit before he goes over, uh, so he can actually take one of the hits. But everyone else will die instantly. Now, sometimes some people actually have him towards the back to absorb a hit, but if you execute it correctly, there's no reason for any of them to be hit whatsoever. In the meantime, we're going to take an opportunity to get a few quick kills up here and move our force into position to eliminate the enemy commander, who, like many of the fights, as we're discovering now, if you knock out the commander, you win the fight. And we can't cross this turn with Obright. Now, here's the positioning. This is the tricky part. We can see we can get him over there right now. Don't do that. You can see, if we did that, then all the, the two snipers there and the Estonian soldier will go straight for him. We have to wait, because we're going to need to provide a diversion. So we're going to position everyone so that they're in a good enough position to cross next turn. We've got to be very careful here about where we put them, because particularly the girl at the rear has a much slower movement speed than the others. So we need to give her the best position possible, otherwise she won't be able to cross. We'll just quickly dispatch this fellow here with the Blaze 1. You can see mascarin has got quite a little bit of mana now, so using Blaze 1 on a regular occasions is really not a big deal. That'll cease to be so attractive later on when we get spells which are really heavy on mana cost. Okay, time to position the little girl just so that we can get over there. Now, they're all ready to cross next turn, but we're going to have to hope that charging Dantes forward at maximum speed is going to draw the ire of those three units, because if they don't, well, we've got a lot of dead civilians on our hands. Not too pleasant at all. Also, I'm still rather disappointed with Kite's attack rating at this point. He's actually wielding, or oh, sorry, using the Protect Ring, which was a item we got last fight. It's not a bad item by any stretch of the imagination. It allows him to use a heal spell by using the item itself, so he can be a tank even more so than he already is. Okay, we can get Slate across here. And it's time to see whether or not our diversion worked. Thankfully, it did. The Dystonian soldier's moving in on Dantes, and I equipped Dantes with the life ring here. A little bit of overkill, to be honest, but as you can see, Dantes is taking none of your BS. Absolutely not. Now, the Dystonian soldiers are going to keep chasing. We should be able to get across without too much of an issue. And right now, I'd like to show you a little bit more information about this particular sink point. In this battle, there are five refugees attempting to cross the border into the Republic. They are relentlessly pursued by ruthless border guards and cannot fight back nor defend themselves. For each we save, we receive 10 experience points for every party member that is alive at the end of the fight. But more importantly, these refugees will show up again in Scenario 3. If we manage to save all five, we will see their entire family in Scenario 3 and receive a special reward. If we fail, we will not see them in Scenario 3. There you have it, a little description of this particular synchronicity or sync point event. I've got to say this is probably one of the more profound synchronicity events, just because it really has very little relevance to the main story, but once you see them in Scenario 3 and you realise, hey, you know, we did that, uh, you know, that's pretty cool. That's something that a lot of RPGs seem to miss out, the idea of making you emotionally connected to NPCs that otherwise would really serve no practical purpose. Not only do they reward you, but they make you feel good about it as well, and that, that's a cool thing. 
Now, I suppose it's about time that we get these fellows out of the way, and I'm not going to be showing you anything else from the main party for a little while, because they're just going to have to be moving across this difficult terrain, which will take a little bit of time. What we're more concerned about is this battle in the middle, and getting our refugees over here. Okay, time to do it. We should be able to get them all over without too much of a problem. My concern at this point is that those soldiers are very close, and they have very good movement rates, and I think some of them are going to get over. Let's find out. In the meantime, we've got to deal with these. Now, I want to put myself between the refugees and the, these two snipers and the Dystonian soldier because I don't trust them at all. It may be that they attempt to go for those weaker targets, and I don't want that to happen. I want to be very cautious here with Slight. I don't want to move forward. Bear in mind, that's a Dystonian soldier. It's got a halberd, and he's going for him anyway. Typical. I should have kept him further back. And this is going to put Slight on very low HP, so we really want to watch out for that. You gotta be so careful in this game not to make silly mistakes because it can cost you. Now these soldiers are not going to be able to get over this turn, but they'll probably be able to get over next turn, so we need to watch out. We might have to deal with a couple of them. Yeah, snipers, this is like the last time we're going to be seeing them. They're so pathetic by this point against most of our heroes that it makes very little difference as to whether they're there or not. They're just a little bit of cannon fodder and they barely even yield any experience. Don't worry, there's plenty of more unpleasant versions of these later on in the game. Now, I could heal Slate, but I don't think we really need to at this point. Although, this is so silly. I, I was in going to try and kill the Dystonian soldier and for some reason I targeted the sniper, which didn't help matters. Like, I was just so edgy about making sure that the refugees got over there and not screwing the whole thing up. Because, of course, if you screw the whole thing up, you've got to restart the entire battle. And that's like 20 minutes worth of battle to get to this point. As you can see, can't stand on the track. Not even on the side of the track. Obviously, railroad safety a primary concern here. Now, they're very close to the snipers, but I don't think that's going to be an issue because I intend to stab them in the head. I better get him healed up. <laughs> let, let me put it that way. Still want to put him between the refugees, though. I want to make sure that that Dystonian soldier is nice and boxed in, just so he doesn't do anything unpredictable. It's highly unlikely, but you never know. The AI can do some crazy things sometimes. And knocks him right back down to the HP that it was before. Oh, well, never mind. He's becoming something of a pincushion. That's fine. Oh, dear. Now things get unpleasant. Thankfully, they're just out of range. These three are not going to be able to cross. Those two are, so we're still on the run here. The refugees are nowhere near safe, and we've got to make sure that we stop the Dystonian soldiers from intersecting them. And they will catch them next turn. There's not a question about it. So we have to act. However, more important than that, time to showcase some stellar voice acting. I shouldn't need to say anything about that. So I'm not going to say anything about it. Let's just ignore it and hope that it never actually happened. <sighs> I can't imagine what they were thinking when they... I assume they didn't actually hire any voice actors for this. They just dragged in random people off the street and offered them a sandwich. To be honest, if offered a sandwich, I'd have still done a better job than that. Roll on scenario two. Okay, time to block the way. I'm not letting those Dystonian soldiers get anywhere near. I'm going to make sure that they have their attention. <laughs> oh. In the meantime, we've been moving our main party over to engage these dwarves who are, like we said in the best, Jerry, they're pretty hardy. Quite tough. They can deal quite a lot of damage, but they're so slow. And they don't really have any special abilities, so we shouldn't be worrying too much about them, but they're going to take a bit of getting past. Now, is Slate going to end up getting himself killed? Possibly. Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunate. Apparently, you can indeed block a sword blow by ducking down and quivering. 
Just bear that in mind in the future, folks. Just a little bit of a tip for life. I feel my claim, of course, that the life ring is imbalanced at this stage of the game, and I must agree, it is absolutely ridiculous at this stage of the game. The problem with the earlier levels is you don't deal with a lot of casters, and the casters are the ones that really deal the damage, particularly to your traditionally tough troops. You can stack defense and you can stack regen to deal with any and all incoming physical damage, but when it comes to magic, that's way, way harder to deal with. Resistance items only come much later in the game, and you've got some inherent resistance within your character, and you've got a couple of support things which can help you out. But still, magic is generally what does the most damage, and magic's what gets you killed. Either that or special attacks. And of course, most of the troops at this point don't possess either. Time to see a dwarf in action now. Scenario 1 is actually guilty of quite a lot of animation reuse. You can see, obviously, that's a clear steal from Obright. Scenarios 2 and 3 are much more creative with their animations, particularly for the hero attacks and spell casting. so there's less use there, but good lord, that was a lot of damage. Uh, I think what we always forget, because Hayward's been so effective up until now, is that he's also made of paper, so we really have to keep him away from that. We don't want that happening. Okay, I think we're about safe. They should be far away from enough troops to not really have too much of a problem, so I think we can call a win there in that respect. In the meantime, though, we've still got an awful lot more troops to deal with. I don't want Maskerin too close, because Maskerin's going to get splattered by those. They have insanely high attack power. If they decide to go for her, it's all over. In the meantime, it's time to shoot a few more fish and barrels. Don't worry, there will come a time where Dantes can't kill absolutely everything on its own. Although that time's not going to be coming for a little while. In fact, actually, I remember in some of my playthroughs that Dantes got killed quite a lot because I got so overconfident with him, started charging him into casters, and then the casters just turned around and said, yeah, okay, you got barely any magic resistance here, eat this spell. And he'd just go down like a sack of potatoes. We better keep Hayward alive. It's probably for the best. He's going to be useful in dealing with the boss character because we don't want to get too close to him if at all possible. The boss leader characters tend to do so much damage. So we've got to be careful. Now, there is actually something I forgot about. There's an item over there over the other side of the track. We'll grab it next turn. It's actually hidden in one of the rocks. But at the moment, we're going to watch the absolutely pointless endeavor of the border guards trying to kill Dantes and him regenerating the damage every turn. It's really quite sad to watch. Yep, and they are stuck. That train is going to take many, many turns to actually get past. And indeed, I'm not even sure if it does. I think it just stays there now. So that really is it. They're stuck across there. They're no more threat. Perhaps not. <laughs> Tornado will be relatively effective. I don't think it's going to kill him, but there's no one that needs healing, and Grace has an awful lot of mana to burn at this point since we're getting relatively close towards the end of the battle. Now, he gets an attack bonus because he's standing next to... Kite, so how much is he going to do? Well, a relatively reasonable amount. It's not too bad at all. A uh, friendship between Kite and Hayward is a good thing to build because Hayward's friendship bonus is crit. So that means more special attacks. And Kite's friendship bonus is attack, which means obviously that Hayward's going to be able to hit an awful lot harder. Helps with his scaling later on.
Now, some people in the thread asked me why exactly I'm using the throwing axe here, and I explained that the starting throwing axe is slightly better than the starting small axe. There's really plenty of opportunity to get the axe up as well as the throwing axe. They are two separate skills because they're two separate weapon ranks, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. The way that we're going to be doing a little bit of power leveling later on in the middle of chapter three is going to allow us to get skill in both. There is just one particular battle which lends itself very well to power leveling and we're looking to promote quite late so that we can get the best possible stats bonus so that when the our force comes back in scenario three they'll be ready to deal with whatever comes their way so the stuff at scenario three towards the end is hard in a way that you have never seen you know, in, as regards to rpgs Yes, thanks for that. <laughs> there are times I wish a kite just wouldn't speak at all. Really. It gets worse. It really does. Okay, Dwar was finally dispatched. Let's go grab that item. Now, there's an item over here called the Gale Ring, if I remember correctly. I think it's in that rock over there. Yes, it is. This gives you defense, and it gives you agility. And hey, look. It's a bit of a plot element. I do like the fact that the sides aren't so clear cut in this game. Well, right, we've got a lone sniper to deal with, and then we're going to be moving on towards the elimination of... What, the, what is with this? I mean, come on! We've had maybe two blocks in the entire game over seven battles, and then we're getting blocks left, right, and center this one. I think it's about time to engage. We want the commander beating on Kite. Kite's the one that can take the damage. Unfortunately, he can't really dish it out, but I think we can probably kill him off in two turns or so, assuming we can get our allies close enough and hey look a large mithril how convenient i don't know how the game actually expects you to find most of this stuff if you didn't already know it was there but again like japanese rpgs there are so many things hidden just because i guess japanese rpg players tend to get a little bit ocd about things and there's the gale ring quite effective again yet another spelling error or just you know grammatical mistranslation or whatever i don't know what it is but it's getting agility and speed mixed up when it says speed, it means agility, which is a way less useful stat than speed, I must say. It's also way more common. Alright, see how much damage we can do here. Quite a nice amount. And the commander does have an awful lot of HP and very good defense. The kite should be able to, hopefully, keep most of these enemies away from the rest of our party because everyone else we've got there is really quite squishy in comparison. Kite's going to be the one taking all the hits and everyone else is just going to be cowering behind him hoping not to get beaten up by the nasty men. Relatively effective strategy but it doesn't always work so we've got to watch out. Just a quick reminder I'm skipping the train movements and I'm now skipping the refugees. We don't need to see them anymore so let's end this. That's probably not the best place to put her, come to think of it. There's an Imperial Mage back there with Blaze 2. I don't think we want to get incinerated, so let's try and split them up just a little bit. I'm going to use Blaze 2 here just because it does a couple of points more damage, and we're going to finish him before we run out of mana anyway, so might as well use the most effective spell we've got. He's down to 13. It's almost dead. This shouldn't be a problem at all. Or will it? And now it starts to get a little bit messy. I actually realized about turn down lines, like, oh dear, I've just let them get hit by an obscene amount of damage. I'm more concerned about Hayward now, sitting on 3 HP. Kite's not going to die, but Hayward, on the other hand, well, he is hoping that we can just wait and hope that you know, all the other enemies are going to jump on Kite. There's only one more space that they could possibly stand. Let's see. Well, the commander's at least going for Kite, and only dealing about three damage, so Kite's safe. There's one space next to him that the enemy could go. The question is, will they? And will Kite be able to finish? Are we going to get a crit? Are we? No, we're not. Even with the crit bonus, no crit. He's got five HP left. And I must say, 
this is one of the silliest things I have done. Really. I healed Kite when, to be honest, I should have healed Hayward. And you're about to find out why. Oh well, I suppose we couldn't have a perfect run. At least she gets 13 XP from the heal. The Stonian Soldier moves to the side and kills Hayward. How unfortunate. And we also lose that trust level that we just acquired. Oh well, we'll have to get it back. That was a monumental screw up on my part. Oh, never mind. Just demonstrates again. The AI is not always predictable. Might as well get Grace a nice bit of well-deserved experience and end the fight on that note. Because we've managed to beat this encounter and save all of the refugees, everyone who is currently alive, so that's everyone except for Hayward, gains 50 experience. My name has been Total Biscuit. This has been Battle 8 in Let's Play Shining Force 3. I will see you next time.